Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello, yes, we seem to be living through a history boom just now, the bookshops crammed with new works, and today we're going to be talking about different ways of writing history, pitfalls, failures, gaps, fresh experiments. One of the most praised new books is Peter England's unusual and surprising history of the First World War, told through 20 lives. While Boris Johnson's Life of London is a biographical study of the men and women who made the city bubbling with his characteristic ebullience. And Alison Weir has been digging through scanty documents and Tudor relics to try to resurrect the true story of Mary Boleyn, Anne's older sister, known at the time as the great and infamous whore. But has her spoor been spoiled by the novelists? First, though, Norman Davis offers us vanished kingdoms. Burgundy, Litva, Tolosa, Borussia and the Kingdom of the Rock, all part of European history, but not, generally speaking, familiar stories. Um, Norman, before I ask you uh, about what motivated this unusual history, just to give us a sense of it, the Kingdom of the Rock, Alt Clud, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, the Kingdom of the Rock, um, because we don't know what it was originally called in the um, fifth and sixth centuries when it, it got going, uh, but it's... Uh, what is now called Strathclyde, uh, but it was the one of the uh, kingdoms of what the Welsh called the Old North, before the Scots came to Scotland, before the English came to, uh, to England. Uh, and this uh, Britonic realm lasted for uh, six or seven hundred years. It was a mm. big slice of the history of, uh, of Northern Britain. Uh, eventually... Um, absorbed into Scotland, but it was neither English nor Scottish. Mm. Uh, a very uh, clear um, character, personality of its own, but almost totally uh, forgotten. Uh, the English have no... Uh, the Northumbrians, of course, in, mm. uh, in the north, had no interest in recording it. Bede mentions it once or twice. Um, the Scots had no interest. And if you go to Dumbarton Rock, which was the, the centre of it, there, equally, there's hardly any memory of this mm. realm. Now, as I take it, you know, we're sitting here in the middle of a European financial crisis and we're wondering what's going to happen to Italy, but part of your point is that we see history simply through the eyes of the winners. We think Italy, there is a state. Uh, we think France, there is a state. But we forget Burgundia. We forget the, the Grand Duchy of Poland, Lithuania. We forget all of those states that were there before. And your case is that, therefore, we are, we are sort of half blind when we look backwards. We are half blind, but it's not a question of, of the winners. Uh, the winners at any particular uh, era become losers themselves. Every polity, every organisation, every state comes to an end mm. sooner or later. Uh, what we see history through all too often is the present, present concerns, people looking backwards from what interests us about our own world and forgetting that the world uh, before us was very different. Mm. Uh, our mental map is decided by what we know about the present, not about uh, what, what, is, um, what is in the past. And it's these present concerns, these present obsessions of one sort or another which obliterate yes. the memory of the past. And so um, you, you focus on places like the sort of European Wild East where the, the, the pagans are being kicked out of the forests by, the, uh, um, by the, German, the, the Teutonic Knights, for instance, and all sorts of parts of European history that haven't been yeah. talked about much. But you go to places. There's a lot of, there's a lot of travel in this book as well. There is, and I, of course I don't like the term the, the Wild East. The, the, <laughs> uh, the, the West was just as wild yeah. as, uh, as the East in many cases. The, um, as it were, the dominant um, focus of European civilization varied. Um, mm. Byzantium for centuries, I don't think, was a Western country. No, but a, Greek, a Greek country, or Greek-speaking... But, but, far more uh, developed than Germany or England or, mm. or France in, in the Middle Ages and so on. So, um, yes, the, um, the, uh, uh, one needs to travel to all these different places to get a feel of what used to be. And a lot of the, um, the comment, a lot of the exploration in the book is what is left when these 
kingdoms disappear? What are the traces? What is the residue? Who are the people who have changed their identity? People who used to think of themselves, whatever, as um, subjects of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and are now either Ukrainians or Belarusians or, uh, or, or whatever. Um, but it, it's a, it applies equally to this country. Uh, the, um, this country is viewed through the dominant concerns of the, of the present. And one of the uh, aspects which was, I've been very struck by is the rise of English nationalism, English identity. Um, I've been touring the book festivals and there's an absolute rash of histories of England where the interests of the United Kingdom are hardly mm. mentioned. Um, I call it anticipatory... Um, um, you think these are the first? These are the first sort of cuckoos of a of a, of a breakup. Yes, yeah. anxiety, anticipatory nostalgia. Anticipatory. I, that's a good. Um, people, as it were, feeling that things are going to change and already preparing themselves for the future realm of England. And in in the motivation for writing this book, how much of it goes back to your early career as a historian, where you focus very much on Poland and on Russia, the history of the Soviet Union, um, one of the one of the vanished supremacies itself, of course. Uh, yes, I, I think the evaporation of the Soviet Union in the twinkling of an eye, it was there. There's a whole industry of my colleagues who thought they had a career for life studying the Soviet <laughs> Union, and it went up in smoke. Yeah. Um, and this had a, a big uh, influence on me. But equally, my, uh, as it were, earlier first interest in, in Poland. Poland was once the biggest state in Europe. Mm. Uh, it collapsed, and it's almost totally forgotten. In the, in the textbooks and, and, and so on, it's barely there. And yet, you go to Krakow, all the tombs of the kings are there. It definitely the Jagili happened. Jagilians. The Jagilians, yes. Yeah, I can't. Boris people, Johnson. People, people remember these uh, kingdoms, don't they? And, and that's why your book's so interesting and so important, because they're there as perpetual kind of fodder for politicians. I mean, I'm, I'm very <laughs> interested by what you had to say about the, the Goths, because I, I remember being in the south of Spain and where all the tourists just love to come and look at all the Moorish, uh, Fanny mm. the Alhambra and all that stuff. And, and so they talk about uh, uh, Andalusia as though it was basically part of this Moorish kingdom. But it really cheeses off the local Catholic Spaniards. So they make a huge effort to big up the, your number one entry, which is the kingdom of the Goths. And, and the Visigoths. The Visigoths. The Visigoths. The Visigoths. And they say, and they say, and you, they point to these formless lumps of rock and they <laughs> say, oh, this was the Gothic palace <laughs> of, so on, of, of someone or other, which, which predated um, the, the Moorish invasions and therefore validates Catholic Spain. Absolutely. The, the point of, of my chapter, however, was that the first kingdom of the Visigoths, which was in Aquitaine, mm. uh, modern Toulouse, they're completely forgotten. Absolutely. Whereas they leave Aquitaine and go over the Pyrenees to Spain, where they are... They set up this new remember, kingdom. And they, the, remember, and the only monuments to the Visigothic kings of Aquitaine are actually but in they're Madrid. But they're remembered because it's politically important for a Catholic yeah. to, to show that the roots of modern Spain are in fact well, Gothic rather look, than... Look, look, I mean, look at the, the, the current Italian crisis and the Lombard League and, and the, you know, the Northern League. They, they, want, they want Lombardy back. Um, Peter England is a, a representative of that large and aggressive uh, imperialist power, Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which was charging across Europe through quite a lot of Norman's history. What did you make of this? Well, um, I think it's uh, it's an interesting point with history always being sort of mirroring mirroring its own time and the the wishes and uh, expectations that are present when, when history is written. But at the same time, I can't really get away from the impression that that both the book of you, Norman, and also the book of Boris is is, is written in some sort of a. It's also a mirror of uh, of this day and age, it, it, they both contain some sort of existential angst yep. about, yes, we, we, we can't really count on we are here now, but mm. are we here tomorrow? And both of them are sort of mirroring... The world which is a very, our feet is, is shaking a little. Yes, bit, it, it's, yeah. it's a very current fear. And yes. that current fear is present in both your books, and you are sort of tackling it from very, in di very different ways. Alice and Weir, we're going to be talking about the, the, the Tudor world later on, but to what extent um, is it important to try to get 
back to understanding how the Tudor English saw their kingdom and their world because they had no idea that there was something called Britain coming. I, no, I think it's very important to see any historical subject or period within the context of its own time. Every history book, I would agree, has got something of modern perceptions mm. about it. Yeah, but yeah, I tend yeah. to... I, I, you, said, you said, Norman, that people saw everything looking backwards from the perspective of their own time. Not all, usually. No, well, usually. <laughs> I, w I would say that it, it's better to look at everything evolving from mm. the beginning and coming forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you can do that, you can see things yes. better mm -hmm. in the context of their own well, time. history went forwards, it didn't go backwards. Exactly, yes, but it's, it's but it can go backwards. On that's it. the whole point. Mm. That, that, that's, that's the point that Peter makes, that mm. it's not a one-way ratchet. Well, let's, t let's turn to Peter. Let's turn <laughs> to <laughs> things, can, things can get worse. They can. can make it go backwards. Yeah. 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 Well, let's turn to Peter's book, because um, Beauty and the Sorrow, you've called it, Peter, Intimate History of the First World War, you take 20 lives and you follow them um, as far as they go through the war, and a little bit uh, like Norman Davis's book, you you know, there's plenty of Transcarpathia and Poland and places that we don't hear so much about in, in the context of right. the First World War. But one of the most poignant things about this book, of course, is that they don't know what's going to happen next. Um, the, the, no. the level of ignorance and un misunderstanding about what's really going on just, just permeates it. Yes, and I think that's... that's uh, you have to have that aspect. If you want to understand people, and I'm not just talking about you know, you know, the ordinary, the foot soldiers and so on, but also kings and politicians, that, that the, the, uh, the, the, they don't see as far mm. as we, of course, now do. We, we have the advantage of the hindsight, and they didn't. And if you, understand, if you want to understand the decisions and the behavior, you must sort of take part of this, the knowledge that we have, we have the drop on them, we, we have the advantage because we know how it all ended, but they didn't. Mm. And much of their emotions and much of their reaction comes out of simply being a part of this massive stream that is called history. So um, you, you chose these 20 people and they include, you know, a Scottish nurse, um, a kind of Venezuelan cavalryman who joins the Ottoman army, mm. a German schoolgirl, French politician, all sorts of people. Yes. Um, from very... First of all, how did you find them? Did you just spend an awful long time going through libraries and uh, diaries? It, it, it's, and... it's... I think everyone who has ever done anything on the Great War nor knows that there is no no uh, problem in finding material. There is a, a, a you say dearth of material? Dearth, yes. you can say. There are a lot of material. Oh, no, no. Abundance, 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 abundance. Yeah. So, so the tricky thing was really choosing these yeah. persons. And, and where I wanted to have something that trying to, to catch, as I said, the, the multiplicity of war, that is not just military men, and not just men, and uh, not just, of course, one nationality, uh, not just even one age. We have mm. a middle-aged man, we have a young girl. And, of course, not just the Western Front, but the other fronts as well. Yes. And, 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 and you know, putting them together in, in that manner, but not knowing really if it would, would work. And in term, terms and of the way that the sort of First World War is sometimes told these days, there's a sort of great conspiracy mm. between emperors and kings and so on, dragging along ordinary people after them. I'm very impressed by the level of sort of mutual hatred in the book shown by kind of you know uh, british nurses towards germans or there's an amazing scene when a, a sort of american polish woman is going back through germany and speaks in english as she's being taken off to the states and is m more and she and her children are more or less mobbed and, yes. and torn apart by by local germans who hear english and go for them yes it uh, that that's uh, that's that's a nasty bit of it, mm. and I think it, we, I think we tend to to look upon the First World War as a sort of more gentlemanly war and so on. And, and you could find that, of course, uh, but you could also find the really nasty bits with massacres going on here and there and all mm. over the place. It, it it was never a nice war in that. Sense. And th though there's plenty of Western Front in your book, to what extent were you also trying to remind people that the I mean, for a lot of people, the Western Front has become the First World War. It, yes. is, it equals the yeah. trenches. But as you point out, this is a war that sprawls into Africa, into across Turkey, Russia, all sorts of places. Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. yes. It, one of the inspirations I got when starting this book, when I was in, in Iraq, in an in a American helicopter, and mm -hmm. I realised that we were flying over an old World War I battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
Ctesiphon. You were flying over, and you were flying over the place where the Romans were defeated, uh, you, you, <laughs> and you, also um, where the Brits were, were defeated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ctesiphon, that's the most amazing thing about Baghdad, and, and that Ctesiphon is fifteen miles south of Baghdad. It, th- this is an area where great Western powers have continually been been, been routed. I thought your, your your book was just fascinating for the the selection of of people who really had nothing to do with running the war no, at all. Of course. And what it shows is that history is now becoming so. You, you use this, you know, there's such a mass of it. Twitter, all this stuff. But, but I wondered, Boris, what, what he's got, of course, are all the diaries and the accounts. And I wonder whether our generation, because of Twitter and so on, there is actually going to be a dearth of written material afterwards. We're not going to, we're not going to have handed on our inner thoughts. At the oh, because that, of the, 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 the electronic decay. Exactly. I worry about electronic de- decay. Mm. And it's a very, it's a very good, a very good point. But I think I'm a, there, are, there are many more books being published. There's much more written material. And what what your book showed to me is that it's up to the you, the historian, to decide what the narrative is. What what is the story? You yes, take these characters. You mm. invented the bits. You, you decide which are the bits that matter in their lives. You've selected the whole analysis. Yes, but, but, Sorry, but just may I just have to, to say one thing here, and, and that, that is about, the book is an experiment. Uh, and and when, I, when I did it, I, saw, I, I picked out the persons, and then I ma- made a sort of uh, a schedule week for week. So, and now it's time for that one to be put into the story, and now it's time for the next one to put into the story. So the selection uh, is partly random. So I didn't always select because, ah, here's, a, here's an interesting part. But here we have this, uh, now it's time for the Venezuelan adventure to step into the action. And then I put him there because it was his, his time. So it's, it's partly a random selection. Alison. I was just going to say, I, I, I often say that it's in the details we sometimes get a bigger picture. And I think your book proves that. Because I think that what you, that the, you quoted something about a soldier sitting watching a body decompose. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And he said, mm. was, he was only, what was it, co- co- carbon sulfate or something? Yes. You know, that's all he was, and that, with some rags of clothing. But that really conveys a perception of the mass scale of death in the Great War and how people probably came to look at it. Yes. Mm-hmm. I remember being told that. One of the things that British troops used to do as they were going over the top of the song, there'd be lots and lots of corpses lying in the, in, the, in the mud, often with sort of hands and stuff still there, and you'd always shake a few hands of the corpses as you went as a little joke. Mm-hmm. And it's, just, you know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, w- w- Norman? I, I was very interested in um, Peter's, uh, I think, successful attempt to, to create the impression of totality. You said multiplicity, but... Um, History is always too big. The First World War is millions and millions of people on thousands and thousands of square miles of territory. There's no way we can summarise that successfully. So somehow we have to find a way of giving the impression of including everything. And he's done that by his 20 witnesses, uh, 10 or 15 episodes from each of them. Mm. I counted it was 271 um, episodes that are in there, which is uh, a small amount to the totality, but it does give the impression. There's a critical mass of experience which creates this necessary um, Mm. uh, illusion of totality. Uh, I I tried to do the same thing writing about the Warsaw Rising by putting in uh, little pages about the experiences of one person at each stage of the story. And if you get the right number of them, the reader gets the feeling about the whole, and you've yeah. done that successfully. But I want, was going to ask you, did you calculate this? Did you, <laughs> as it were, work out how many of these have I got to do before we get the right effect? No, I, I'm just going to say that, that the book was really an experiment in history writing because I, I told my publisher I don't know if it will work. It, it's perhaps when in, in the end of the day I will simply have to chuck it all in the bin because I didn't know that this mm. will work. It well, was an experiment. <laughs> well, can, can I ask about what well, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, novels in history later on? But can I ask? Um, y- there is a sort of um, a, a novelish aspect to it in the sense that you know you you, you talk about the smell of the grass, yes. the, the, the the sunlight, the birds, whatever it might be. Um, you know the feeling of the surge uniform, which must often be you imagining that they can't all be there in in the original diaries and letters, can well, it? Well, most of it. I mean. It's it's the same as uh, in Alison when she writes about something glinting in the sun and so on, and you knew that there was sun and it and, the, and the building yes. was white it would and so. Never be it would never be there unless there was sun. No, I, I would I wouldn't invent it. I wouldn't I wouldn't I see I'm an historian and I can't invent 
Mm. So, so no, and I also choose these uh, these persons because they have good source material. They are rich in these types of, of detail. details. Yes, but you can yes. have a basic sense of what where you what you think the story is, and you can select, as all journalists do and all writers, you can select the quotations and the and the bits of narrative yes. that you use in order to get to that end point. And think about the history of the of the Second World War. Which I think you you uh, talk about Norman. We, we grow up thinking that we won the Second World War exactly. in this country. And actually, you can look at the two world wars in, in the 20th century and say they were a disaster for mm. Britain. Or mm. we were extremely mm. lucky to finish up on the winning side. That's how I would put it. But that we won the war is, is comical. Yeah. No. Well, let's, let's turn to, to Boris Johnson's uh, Life of London, because you've again chosen um, a series of individual stories um, to, 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 to be bigger picture. Unashamedly celebratory. This is, this, is, this is your case for London as potentially the world's most important city, the place that has changed most. Well, I uh, put it number three. I give it, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not that immodest. I say yeah. that... I say, I say Athens, that Rome. Ath- Athens, Rome, Rome and, 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 and right. you, know, you could make yep. a case for Jerusalem, uh, but I, I, think, I think it's up there. It's certainly up yeah. there. There's a programmatic city. It's a city that has informed the planet and uh, dictated uh, or helped to shape mm-hmm. customs and habits, language... Uh, around the world, I think London really does rank with those two ancient uh, cities. So my my book is really sort of attempt to explain what it is that has produced this greatness. And always, always tell the news through people. Look at some of the people who have been there at some of the the critical mm. moments, and indeed contributed great things. Shakespeare, all the rest. Of it. And I suppose I found a great big conglomerate of things that make London great, and there, there'll be. Uh, rock language, music, rock finances, music yeah. finance, yeah. banking, stability, mm-hmm. the rule of law, journalism, popular infrastructure. journalism, infrastructure is the is the is the, the key thing on which I I end the book because time and again you see that London has become successful because of prudent investment and expansion of transport infrastructure. So, so and uh, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a fascinating story. But what it what it also shows, I'm afraid, is and this is something that some people find irritating. It does show, I think, that greatness is produced by the spark of competition. And London is an arena where talents come together and, mm-hmm. not, and jostle. And it's because of that jostling that you get Shakespeare. If Shakespeare hadn't had to compete with Decker and Kidd and Marlowe and all these other guys, he wouldn't necessarily have put so many bums on seats uh, and so on and so forth. And that's why Hook yeah. produced all his great... Uh, that's why Haydn, it's why Haydn comes to London, because he can sell tickets. He can exactly sell tickets right. for his, his, his symphonies. Exactly right. um, but listening to you talk, it's quite clear that this is... It's a history book, but it's also a sort of London manifesto of a kind, isn't it? Well, it's, 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 I it's suppose got a political it is, content, and it's got yes, a Boris I mean, I, I, content. Peter, Peter, Peter would, would, would uh, say that it's the subject of existential angst. I don't think it's a subject of existential angst. <laughs> I, 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 uh, that's to say, I'm, 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 in, I'm incredibly confident about the future. You don't seem very future. angst. No, I'm not. Said, I'm not. No. And what I, what, I, what I was really trying to do was to illustrate for myself and for, for others what the necessary conditions are for the, the further success of, of the city. And given, and given where London is now, I mean, one of the, 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 the sort of themes running through it um, is London's relationship with the rest of Britain, the rest of Europe and so on. But... Has there been a time when London was as um, varied and as distinct compared to the rest of the country? I mean, London sort of does yes, sit out absolutely. as a kind of uh, city-state. I mean, London, I think, I think there's, there's scarcely been a time in the history of the city when, uh, when fewer than 20% of the population were, were born abroad. It's now, I think, up to about 30 Six percent. Don't forget, London was founded by a bunch of pushy Italian immigrants. Mm. Uh, and when the, the first city, Lond- Londinium, was a collection of Scythians and Belgians and Serbs and Turks and heaven knows what, all, all, all uh, of whom were, of course, massacred. Turks. Not We've got sure. t- <laughs> uh, well, um, well, they, they, they have people, people from what is now Turkey. <laughs> Let me put that. Put it, people from what is now Turkey. Turkey yes, like Boris Johnson. Like, exactly. <laughs> and and uh, they were they they were they were they yeah. were massacred. Yeah. Uh, every single one of them by Boudicca. one of one of Norman's uh, Celts. And and the, and the and the and the paradox is, well, we think of Boudicca as a great national. Heroine. In fact, you know, her, her, oh, great, her greatest came, achievement came from Norfolk, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> her greatest achievement was really to, to prompt the Romans, to encourage the Romans to invest in London infrastructure. Was the most important thing because because she destroyed it first. Um, and in terms of the sort of the, the, the selection that you made, you did, did you just go through sort of century by century? Think well, who's the, who's going to be the no, most? No, I, I wanted I wanted people who had done things that uh, I thought 
emblematise also were, were were part of what London had done for the world, and so I wanted. Chaucer, because he basically mm. took the two great strains of our language and fused them together and created this dominant mm. language, which has more uh, lexemes than any other language on the world in the world by a factor of, of, of two. I think uh, I wanted Shakespeare because he really cre- recreated uh, drama and sent it around the world. Sixteen oh nine. Hamlet was performed off the coast Africa, of, yeah. uh, of Africa, Sierra Leone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. German German companies were performing Hamlet uh, in German in the 1620s. It's absolutely incredible the spread of mm-hmm. uh, of those ideas. And then I wanted, obviously, I wanted banking, so I shoved in. I had uh, I had Rothschild. Uh, um, actually, of course, Dick I had Whittington. Dick Whittington. Dick, Dick, Whittington. Dick yeah. Whittington, who notorious financial um, a, a operator, an amazing <laughs> operator. Mm. What a man! What mm. a man! He he, he brilliantly persuades the government uh, to make him the comptroller of the wool subsidy at the same time as he's being exempt. Uh, wool subsidy is a kind of tax on exports. So it's, basically, it's like putting, the, it's like putting the, the chief executive of Goldman Sachs in charge of the financial but services. Also it's, going, it's, going, it's going back to the political fu- <laughs> funding of political parties, in essence. I mean, he's got, he's got the king where he needs him because he he's did. funding him. He bankrolled uh, Agincourt. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, he, he was... A, a, but the great thing about Whittington, and the reason we all love him, the reason we go to watch his... Panto, he gave prodigious sums. And mm. there are still people in East Grinstead who are financed by a bequest, uh, elderly people in East Grinstead, uh, who are financed by a bequest of Dick Whittington in the, mm. in the late uh, 14th century. Mm. And that is, a, that is something that, uh, or sorry, the early 15th century, that is something that I think modern bankers could learn from with profit. Mm. The greatest film ever made about London, I think, was Passport to Pimlico, which is about... Yes. Part of London finding, discovering that it's actually not in London at all. It's it's Burgundian. Um, they, 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 there's a charter they find. They're Burgundians. There's a wonderful line. Blimey, I'm a foreigner, says one of them. But in a sense, that's the underlying message of your book. I mean, the number of people who've come into London from different yes. parties. Almost all the characters. Blimey, I'm a foreigner. Almost yeah. all the characters. I'm afraid. Although they, they, you, you could uh, make a, quite a good case of them being being Londoners. They've almost all been uh, born in some other city. They come to London to make something of themselves. Mm. What are the rest of it? Alison, what do you make of this? I think it's a fascinating approach looking at a city um, and its development through people who have achieved a lot in different areas. And I found that, I found that, uh, being particularly interested in Chaucer, of course, I was so glad you included him. Isn't he great? He's wonderful, yes, mm. absolutely. And, and, it, and it, it, he captures some of the spirit of London at that time and life at that time. We learn so much, as, for, as with Shakespeare. And they're all really still together, aren't they? All those guys in, in Chaucer, you know, the kind of the people with the colossal zit on their nose and the, and the, the they fornicating are. All human life the, is there. Human nature all... doesn't change. They're still there. Norman. Uh, yes, it's uh, absolute vintage Borishan uh, <laughs> rhetoric, uh, which uh, is very enjoyable. Uh, but he does take sides, and ve- very much on the side, if you like, of the imperial... Um, Migrants, as opposed to the the hardworking natives, you know, the the ancient Britons are boneheaded. <laughs> uh, well, that's because they kill the Romans, normally. Well, absolutely. The, you mean, you okay. take the side of the uh, Italians, as you <laughs> as you say. Similarly, as you um, talk very um, uh, unkindly about the the English, who were. Uh, I right. think stuffed, licked, um, conquered by by the, no, by the Normans. On, on the I, I contrary, to... no, no, on the contrary, I, that's <laughs> a Norman speaks. Un... Oh, no, no, that's, speaks. no, that's no, that's <laughs> a description of that's a, that's very unfair. I give, I give, Al, I rescue, I rescue Alfred the Great from the uh, oblivion to which he has been consigned by modern historians. I, I, just, I explain how he helped create the idea of the Anglo-Saxon world. And uh, I think uh, the concept of, uh, of the English kingdom that he, and the English language, king of all, ongol kin, uh, <laughs> that he is uh, by the end, I think, I, I think that's, that's very firmly that. What I'm trying to express is the, the oppression of that Norman keep suddenly whacked in the middle of London. It was a propaganda statement. It was saying, you've been beaten, you've been... Oh, that wasn't meant to be uh, in any way. There were the three Romans, of them. Really. Um, mm. There were, there were mm. three of there them. Were. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Um, there is an really. interesting point here. Um, could you do the same... Could you make the same point? Obviously you can't, but could you make the same approach? You're using now extraordinary people. If you used infraordinary people, as sort of I have in my book... I thought I, about that. And I, 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 thought is it, would it, I think, it, <laughs> of course, it would be very tricky to find it because, as, as Alison has shown in her book, we have the, the problem with sources. It's you don't have sources. to go a long, mm. long way away to have the problem with sources. But it would be an interesting experiment to try and 
make the mm. same point with infraordinary people instead of these larger than life uh, of course it, of course it would and, and in an ideal world i would the book would be greatly expanded to, to include uh much more of the of the bottom up uh view and much more of how these changes impacted on on the lives of, mm. of other people but the trouble is as you say the evidence the, ev the evidence is so thin particularly for the first kind of 1500 right. years well let's turn directly to that that question of evidence and sources and alison weir's book about the life of mary boleyn um the great and infamous whore as she was described um uh, in, in her own lifetime i think alice yes that's correct um now She is somebody who is quite well known uh, in this country through novels, or through a novel in particular, wasn't it? The Other Boleyn Girl. That's correct. Prior to that, she was just a footnote in She's history a, books. She was a That's footnote. Correct, you've you've yes. been interested in her for a long time. Yes. Um, so how difficult is it to start to, decon to, to construct the real, the historic uh, Mary Boleyn from the, 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 the figure in the novel? It's quite a challenge because you're dealing literally with fragments of information and you, uh, original source material. You have to make some sense of them and put them in the context of the age in which they, they occur. And, and you have to try and you know, see if you, you... You're never going to get close to your subject. This is the problem. You're going to write a biography of someone which is essentially detective work. You may not have any many quotes or many letters. For those, for those who don't know the story, let's just, just go through the headlines... Older sister of Anne Boleyn. Yes, mis Mistress of both Henry VIII and Françoise the first, first of France, of France yeah. probably. Yes, probably, uh, probably. yes. Um, and later on, certainly, conducts um, a marriage to uh, a less well-born man. Plain Mr William Stafford, Plain yes. Plain Mr William Stafford, and gets into horrible, out, horrible out, trouble. Outrage, the outrage of her family, yes, that's And correct. this was because she hadn't asked her sister's permission, her sister by then being queen. Yes, that's correct, but she's more important than that, because the, her affair with Henry VIII, while one might not think that a liaison that lasts less than two years with a king um, is going to be very important historically, it is, because she was a war walking reminder of the of the barrier to his marriage to her sister Anne mm. and it, it, and that the fact that he pursued Anne he wanted to marry Anne placed him if he married Anne it placed him in exactly the same degree of affinity to Anne as he was to Catherine of Aragon he was arguing these were the grounds on which he wanted a divorce and and, and history unfolds now you are um as you say struggling with sources even the portraits of Mary Boleyn, we're not sure that it's Mary Boleyn. It's almost certain that the, the portrait that's often reproduced of her, of which six versions exist, is not Mary Boleyn. Yeah, um, despite the fact that the good, wonderful, gorgeous Holbein drawings of uh, most of the court at the time. Yeah. Some of them are anonymous. How do we know that one of them isn't Mary Boleyn? This is the frustrating yeah. thing yes. about it. It's yes. what we don't know that's the problem. And then in the middle of the, the book and the research, there is this absolutely extraordinary letter. Suddenly yeah. her own voice uh, emerges, and this is her writing to her sister. That's no, it's her writing to, to Thomas Cromwell to after Thomas Cromwell. she's been banished from court yes. after making that yeah. marriage, and it gives us great insights. For well I might have had a greater man of birth and a higher, but I assure you I could never have had one that should have loved me so well, nor a more honest man. I would rather beg my bread with him than be the greatest queen christened. Meow. Wonderful, <laughs> yes. And this... and and. Um, there is a sort of, probably a sort of happy ending to this story because she, she and this relatively low-born guy go off and are happy and they, domestic. Yes, yes, they do. They make this marriage. They're not very well off. He's 11 years her junior, probably. Uh, but they are happy. It's quite clear from this letter that he loved and cherished her. She was held by, in little account by anyone else. Um, they made this marriage. They stayed together through, through a lot of adversity. You could run away to the country in those days and, 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 and get, get outside. Run away to Calais, the... actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Um, so when you when you kind of uh, start on this kind of project, how do you how do you treat it? Do you start with the the source materials? Do you go back yes. as far as you can and then yes. and then read on with the secondary? Um, I, I always start with with just an outline, my proposal, which is about a page and a half long, and that's an outline, a skeleton, and then I go back to the original sources and research into that. So so it, the book evolves, mm. and then I look at the secondary sources. And it was never more apparent than when writing this book that, that I've never written about a subject that's been so mythologized, misrepresented, <laughs> and romanticized. And I'm not just talking about that novel, and mm. therefore. 
historiography plays a large part in this biography of Mary Boleyn. It's how our perceptions of her have evolved over the mm. centuries or and over the decades. And, and it's not not just the Abby Boleyn girl, but um, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall, for instance, yes. it, uh, dealing, dealing with the same sort of period and giving the reader a very intense sense of being there. Yes, and, and these two novels have been so popular, so influential, that people think, <coughs> and people do think, that what's in historical novels is, is history. I'm afraid that is the perception. Yes. Have they got it wrong, though? That's what it, yes, it, they have. Okay. Yes, <laughs> indeed. This, okay, yes. That, that's what I, I'd love to know. Yes, I'd love to, But I'd... they are novels, so they're allowed to do that. I would contend that if you write historical fiction, and I do, that you write an author's note at the back to say where you have Parted from the historical record, but you would use the sources when they, where they are there, where they exist. I, so. I have an even simpler solution to it: that everything uh, that that is put in a work of fiction becomes fiction. Uh, that's, that, that I is, would agree, but a so, lot of so, people so when believe when it's you are fact. Writing, so if you're writing a novel about uh, Winston Churchill during mm. the Second World War, it will not be about the real Winston Churchill. No. It will be a sort of uh, fictional mm. Winston Churchill in a fictional Britain in a fictional yes. World War. Norman Everything Davis. becomes fiction. Yeah. Norman Davis. Uh, Alison has written a study of a person in the wider scale of things is a minor figure, but it has major implications because it's, it's not just individual people that get labelled uh, negatively. Mm. Um, whole groups of people, whole nations yes, uh, are uh, bad mouthed in the same way and this bad mouthing which uh, people rather like actually, uh, gets endlessly repeated until some mm. scholar comes along and says well uh, the record is, is not quite that, like that and I think that's a, a service uh, which applies to uh, Mary that's Berlin, the, but it applies to all sorts of people. But that's yes. the key question, because you see, there are it's two, there are two types. There are two types of violation, aren't there? There's the there's the there's the violation of fact, and the, and the, and and I think that some of the authors, the, the novelists that you mentioned, have juggled around with the, with the, the actual events in order to to suit their narrative. But then also, there's skewing the facts or using the facts in such a way as to build a different prejudice or a different image, or in the mind of the reader or of, of posterity about this person. And, was she or was she not a great and infamous whore? It's as an it inverted says. commas. OK. Yes. It's so, mm. so, 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 from the papal <laughs> nuncio. So it is in so, yes, yes, So it is. basically yes. you're it saying is. the great and infamous whore not. Well, that's <laughs> what the research showed. You can only go with what you're researching. Yes. Where's but the evidence? We, there we, is no exactly. evidence. Are we, wor are sorry. we worried, sorry, about... Mm. about um, I, mean, I just want to stay a little bit on the, the question of the novels because you go into a bookshop at the moment and there's a big historical section and it's not always clear what's historical fiction and what's history anymore. I have you know, great they're, concerns about they're slammed that. up against each other. They are. I have great concerns about that because the demarcation line has become increasingly blurred. Mm. I'm actually addressing the Institute of Historical Research's conference on, on Friday about, uh, the use, uh, about historical fiction because there is concern that it is skewing everybody's view of history, mm. particularly mm. about the period of which I write about. I think that's in, I think incredibly interesting and important, but I'll just get back to what we were thinking about with, uh, with Peter's book, which is, after all, perhaps the most kind of uh, purest form of history that, that, that you can find. It's, it's simply the accounts of, of the lives of individual actors uh, in, in, the, in the First World War. But you've chosen them, you've selected them, uh, yes. you've taken those quotes, and we all know what yeah. you can do with the, with the selection of material yes. uh, in yes. order to produce the narrative or effect that you want. So I wonder, in a timid way, whether the, the boundary is very, is very easy to draw. I, 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 would say, I would say it is. Eventually, it, it, you, you can have the problems with, with exact uh, defining and so on, but I'm I know that the, the people who are doing it, they know very well what they are doing and if they are doing fiction or not. I think the problem is, is many times, as you sort of suggested, it's in the mind of the reader and it's also in the packaging. And, and just returning to where we started from, um, to, to all of you, really, how important is it to, to be there, to go there, to have a sense of the physical um, remnant of the story? Because everybody involved has travelled a bit. Yes. Um, to these places and you know I, I'm going to Constantinople where you're told um, when the Turks broke in um, to Hagia Sophia they charged in through this door and they, they slaughtered everybody they in front of them but when you actually go to it it's quite clear that it couldn't have happened quite that way because of the, the geography of the building so um, I just wonder how often going going to a place I'm not so certain about that well, I don't think they did. I don't think I don't think the slaughter took place as quite as it was it was as it was alleged. Partly also because they wanted to take everybody as slaves, mm -hmm. um, so they didn't kill them because they wanted them as slaves. But 
That's well, we have some we have some pretty good eyewitness accounts, not least by from the, the Venetian ambassador at the time of, of what took place, and it wasn't much fun. It wasn't fun. Uh, no, so, it wasn't, I mean, it know, wasn't fun. Yeah. Certainly. So, whatever whatever, whatever given... you're proposing to say about about uh, what what happened in Constantinople in, in 40, no, I'm just I'm just 40, 50, yeah, you can't sanitize it completely. No, no, I certainly wouldn't dream of doing that. All history is determined by time and space. These are the, the dimensions which everything happens, uh, and it's very important, I think, to to see the location of where things happen. Uh, this is one of my uh, inspirations for this book. I went to as many of these vanished kingdoms as I could. But the other thing is time. You go to Dumbarton you know, or you go to um, um, Kaliningrad, mm. which is in Russia, which is where the, the Prussian story began. But in Kaliningrad, you have hardly any uh, mm. echo of the presence of the great kingdom of Prussia. Uh, and this is what's interesting, that time... Uh, gives a completely different um, rubs away so much flavour to the to the place. It's brands. It's all about brands, Norman. Uh, in the end, it, you see, Prussia is not a good brand these days, but but Rome still has a bit of a bit of cachet. But Kaliningrad is uh, ca- uh, nah. less this week than it had last. I have to say. Uh, well, but yeah. no, but there is there are still plenty of people who, who you yeah, know yeah. Uh, there, think there are the seven Roman Prussians was, and was, was, was the sixth cool. of the seven Prussians had a very bad brand. I agree. And, and so, so what you're, what's so brilliant? I, I'm not allowed to say how brilliant your, these books no, are. They're not. But, the, but what I think so so one of is you've resurrected some of these uh, kingdoms and and made them available to future demagogic politicians in those areas <laughs> to become the heirs and successors. Oh, there is, yes. The so- well, Savoyard the, 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 liberation movement. I bet there is. <laughs> I, I think there is. You, you, sometimes there is. A, uh, I think it's an irresistible pull to, to visit. And I've been visiting, I've been writing mainly about the 17th century and travelled in Poland when I wrote about you know, the Polish wars and so on. Uh, and it's an irresistible pull to go there. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you will always know, you will almost invariably be a bit disappointed because Mm. time has passed on and so on. Um, That's inevitable. Well, our time has passed on, sadly, so thank you to all my guests. We're out of time. Norman Davis's Vanished Kingdoms, Peter Englund's Intimate History of the First World War, The Beauty and the Sorrow, Boris Johnson's Life of London and Alison Weir's book on Mary Boleyn are all out now. Next week, How the Arts Take on Politics with Rory Bremner, Peter Kosminski and Irona Blasnik. But for now, goodbye. Did you? Who are the people who have changed their identity? People who used to think of themselves, whatever, as um, subjects of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and are now either Ukrainians or Belarusians or, uh, or, or whatever. Um, but it's a, it applies equally to this country. Uh, the, um, this country is viewed through the dominant concerns of the of the present. And one of the uh, aspects which was, I've been very struck by is the rise of English nationalism, English identity. Um, I've been touring the book festivals and there's an absolute rash of histories of England where the interests of the United Kingdom are hardly mm. mentioned. Um, I call it anticipatory... Um, um, you think these are the first? These are the first sort of cuckoos of a of a, of a breakup. Yes, yeah. anxiety, uh, anticipatory nostalgia. Anticipatory. I, that's a good. Uh, um, people, as it were, feeling that things are going to change and already preparing themselves for the future realm of England. And in in the motivation for writing this book, how much of it goes back to your early career as a historian, where you focus very much on Poland and on Russia, the history of the Soviet Union, um, one of the one of the vanished supremacies itself, of course. Uh, yes, I, I think the evaporation of the Soviet Union in the twinkling of an eye, it was there. There's a whole industry of my colleagues who thought they had a career for life studying the Soviet <laughs> Union, and it went up in smoke. Yeah. Um, Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. Hello. Yes, we seem to be living through a history boom just now. The bookshop's crammed with new works. And today we're going to be talking about different ways of writing history. Pitfalls, failures, gaps, fresh experiments. One of the most praised new books is Peter England's unusual and surprising history of the First World War told through 20 lives. 
while Boris Johnson's Life of London is a biographical study of the men and women who made the city bubbling with his characteristic ebullience. And Alison Weir has been digging through scanty documents and Tudor relics to try to resurrect the true story of Mary Boleyn, Anne's older sister, known at the time as the great and infamous whore. But has her spoor been spoiled by the novelists? First, though, Norman Davis offers us vanished kingdoms. Burgundy, Litva, Tolosa, Borussia and the Kingdom of the Rock, all part of European history, but not, generally speaking, familiar stories. Um, Norman, before I ask you uh, about what motivated this unusual history, just to give us a sense of it, the Kingdom of the Rock, Alt Klud, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, the Kingdom of the Rock, um, because we don't know what it was originally called in the um, 5th and 6th centuries when it, it got going, uh, but it's... Uh, what is now called Strathclyde, uh, but it was the one of the uh, kingdoms of what the Welsh called the Old North before the Scots came to Scotland, before the English came to uh, to England, uh, and this uh, Britonic realm lasted for uh, six or seven hundred years. It was a big slice of the history of uh, of Northern Britain. Uh, eventually. Um, absorbed into Scotland, but it was neither English nor Scottish. Mm. A very uh, clear um, character, personality of its own, but almost totally uh, forgotten. Uh, the English have no... Uh, the Northumbrians, of course, in, mm. uh, in the north, had no interest in recording it. Bede mentions it once or twice. Um, the Scots had no interest. And if you go to Dumbarton Rock, which was the, the centre of it, there, equally, there's hardly any memory of this mm. realm. Now, as I take it, you know, we're sitting here in the middle of a European financial crisis and we're wondering what's going to happen to Italy, but part of your point is that we see history simply through the eyes of the winners. We think Italy, there is a state. Uh, we think France, there is a state. But we forget Burgundia. We forget the, the Grand Duchy of Poland, Lithuania. We forget all of those states that were there before. And your case is that, therefore, we are, we are sort of half-blind when we look backwards. We are half-blind, but it's not a question of, of the winners. Uh, the winners at any particular uh, era become losers themselves. Every polity, every organisation, every state comes to an end mm. sooner or later. Uh, what we see history through all too often is the present, present concerns, people looking backwards from what interests us about our own world and forgetting that the world uh, before us was very different. Mm. Uh, our mental map is decided by what we know about the present, not about... Uh, what what is um, what is in the past, and it's these present concerns, these present obsessions of one sort or another, which obliterate yes. the memory of the past. And so um, you you focus on places like the sort of European Wild East, where the the, the pagans have been kicked out of the forests by the uh, um, by the German the, the Teutonic Knights, for instance, and all sorts of parts of European history that haven't been yeah. talked about much. But you go to places. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of travel in this book as well. There is. And, I, of course, I don't like the term the, the Wild East. The, the, <laughs> uh, the, the West was just as wild yeah. as, uh, as the East in many cases. The, um, as it were, the dominant um, focus of European civilization varied. Mm. Um, Byzantium, for centuries, I don't think was a Western country. No, but a, Greek, a Greek country, or Greek-speaking... But, but far more uh, developed than Germany or England or, mm. or France in, in the Middle Ages and so on. So, um, yes, the, um, the, uh, uh, one needs to travel to all these different places to get a feel of what used to be. And a lot of the, um, the comment, a lot of the exploration in the book is what is left when these kingdoms disappear? What are the traces? What is the res... And this had a, a big uh, influence on me, but equally my, uh, as it were, earlier first interest in, in Poland. Poland was once the biggest state in Europe. Mm. Uh, 
it collapsed and it's almost totally forgotten in the in the textbooks and, and, and so on. It's barely there, and yet you go to Krakow, all the tombs of the kings are there. It, it definitely the Jagili- happened. Jagilians. The Jagilians, yes. Yeah, yeah, I can't. Boris people, Johnson. People, people remember these uh, kingdoms, don't they? And, and that's why your book's so interesting and so important, because they're there as perpetual kind of fodder for politicians. I mean, I'm very <laughs> interested by what you had to say about the, the Goths, because I, I remember being in the south of Spain, and where all the tourists just love to come and look at all the Moorish... Uh, Fanny the Alhambra and all that stuff. And, and so they talk about uh, uh, Andalusia as though it was basically part of this Moorish kingdom. But it really cheeses off the local Catholic Spaniards. So they make a huge effort to big up the, your number one entry, which is the kingdom of the Goths. And, and the Visigoths. The Visigoths. The Visigoths. And they say, and they, say, and you, they point to these formless lumps of rock and they <laughs> say, oh, this was the Gothic palace mm-hmm. of, so, of, of someone or other, which, which predated... Um, the the Moorish invasions and therefore validates Catholic Spain. Absolutely. The the point of of my chapter, however, was that the first kingdom of the Visigoths, which was in Aquitaine, mm. uh, modern Toulouse, they're completely forgotten. Absolutely. Whereas they leave Aquitaine and go over the Pyrenees to Spain, where they are 